morning, everybody. We're going to be in number 153 in your hymns. Good morning. Hello. 153. Stand with me, please, on number 153. All right. Tis the grandest theme through the ages run. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal time. Tis the grandest theme that the world dare sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or main. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme. Tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme. Let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith. He will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. Sing it out. We serve a God that is able to deliver us. Amen on that. Glad you're here this morning. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we ask you to be about us today and that your spirit might move. Lord, we ask that there be power in singing and power in the preaching. And Lord, I enjoyable fellowship. And I ask you to help us to leave here encouraged to do more for you. In your son's name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. All right, 237, 237. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Last chance, fourth verse. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by
We're so glad you're here today. If you're a visitor for the first time, you're our honored guest. And we're so glad that you're here to be a part of our service. And if you've not received a visitor card, we'd sure love to have a record of your visit. And so we can give you a gift at the end of the service. If you're a visitor today and have not received a card, if you'll just raise your hand, we'll not embarrass you, but we'll just slip you a card so you can fill that out and turn it in after the service is over. Anybody like that? Oh, yeah, great. Vito and Tyler, yeah, great. Uh, up front here, Brother Tim. And I'm glad that they're here. Uh, Andrew has friends that uh, come to find out. And so thankful for that. I did tell them I'm sorry um, that Andrew is uh, their friends, but uh, we're glad you're here today and uh, enjoyable. And got to play some carpet ball with them. They're a great time. And I'm glad Andrew has some friends here today. Oh, one more with Vito right here. Uh, both of them right here. Vito. So perfect. Thank you. Hey, if you'll, you'll fellas, you'll fill that out. And at the end of the service, Andrew will show you where it's at. And we'll get you a nice gift, right? And anybody else this morning that has not received a visitor card, but you're a visitor this morning? Oh, just raise your hand, we'll get you a card. Very good. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. Excited to see what the Lord's going to do. And the choir will sing now.
Stand with us, please. Number 339, 339, heaven came down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned. Go ahead and shake hands for a moment. Second verse, born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down in glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down in glory filled. On that last verse, now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Riches eternal and blessings to burn from his precious hand I receive. You sing. See everybody here this morning. Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 6, if you will. Isaiah chapter 6. 
and I appreciate visitors being here. Good to have visitors here this morning. I had the privilege of teaching teen class this morning. I appreciate Brother Bussy letting me come down there and teach the teens, and we had a good time down there. And uh, we're excited. The teens are a little extra excited. Uh, this Friday at our youth conference, they will be able to use their gymnasium for the first time, our gymnasium. So we're really excited about that. And the Lord is good in that area. We praise the Lord for that. Good to see everybody here today. Appreciate you faithful folk. And uh, always good to see a good crowd, though, Sunday after Easter. Amen. And uh, that's a blessing. So great services last Sunday. Praise the Lord for that. But that was the past, and now we're here for the present. Look at what God's going to do. Verse 5, here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Then said I, Isaiah here, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Thank you so much. You may be seated. And at this time, we're going to have a special and get right to the message. Thank you. think about the Lord and all the things he's done. He meets my every need. You know he's been so good to me and I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done. For all he's done. I'm gonna lift my hands and praise him for all try to live my life to please him even though i don't deserve to live my life has just begun and i can't help but praise the lord for all he's done there are many things that i could praise god for and if i started now until If I could mention only one, I'd have to thank him for his son. Now that's enough to praise the Lord for all he's done. For all he's done, I'm going to lift my hands and praise him for all he's done. I'll try to live my life to please him. My life has just begun, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done. For all he's done, I'm going to lift my hands and praise him for all he's done. I'll try to live my life to please him, even though I don't deserve to live. My life has just begun. And I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done. Even though I don't deserve to live, my life has just begun. And I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done. Amen. Why don't you look at me there in Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, it went out there, didn't it? We're okay. This is a brand new mic, so we're, uh, it seems to work for everybody but me. So uh, I'm the problem, not the sounder, man. That's, that's for sure. Uh, thank you for that amen. Who was that? Bedwell, was that you? Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. You were the only one that was honest. There's probably 50 others that wanted to say it, so... Amen. Uh, the men made it back from their getaway trip. That sounds weird saying getaway with men. Their fishing trip, that sounds better, right? And I heard they had a good time. I got to spend one day with them. And they did finally catch a fish. It was a goldfish out of a bag, right, Charlie? 
I saw a picture of you holding the goldfish. That was the only fish they caught of the week. What a, what a blessing, amen. One of those times, one of those times. I want to speak briefly today on the obituary of the church. The obituary of the church. I didn't really know when the Lord was going to have me preach this, and it's just fitting that it's the Sunday before we officially open our gymnasium, maybe. I hope you know my heart. This is more of a pastoral message, and I taught the teens a pastoral lesson. And when I say pastoral, what that means is sometimes in my family, I'll say, we're going to have a family meeting tonight, and, uh, and we have, sometimes I'll say family meeting, and we'll all get together, and we'll discuss plans for the week or, or what's going on. But sometimes I'll say, I'm going to talk to you as a father now, and they know that means it can be sometimes a little bit, some of the stuff might sting or and maybe just some observations I made about our family that I think we just need to look at in the mirror and just correct and fix. And so visitors today, you just sit back and relax and enjoy. Uh, I hope this message will be a blessing and encouragement to you on where this church stands. But as we head into this new building and the new project, I'm so excited about what God can and will and should do. I really believe that. And yes, I said should on purpose. But I also have to be aware of what the devil plans to do also. And the devil is going to fight very hard. He does not like what may happen, and he's going to fight hard. And, and this is a maintenance message. It's a preventative message. It's a message that I think will challenge all of us to make sure we don't fall into the trap. Because all we always preach about how we want to be used of God or used by God, we can also be used by the devil. Even saved people can be used by the devil. I, unfortunately, have been used by him a few times, more than a few times in my life, and I regret that. Friday night, my wife and I went on a date, and we got back from our date, and we had some neighborhood kids in our driveway, and we were shooting around baskets and having a good time, and my son made two neighborhood kids run suicides in our driveway. What a blessing. He was making them run and touch lines and back and forth. And the boys willingly did it. And it finally got dark, and the boys went home, and all of a sudden our power went out. Our power went out in our house. And, uh, and uh, so when the power went out, I, I, I thought, oh, man, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we, we Americans are so spoiled. I said, well, hey, let's just go to the church. And so all six of us jumped in the car, and we drove here, and we parked down at the bottom, and we came into the building, and Looked at my off, new office stuff and walked around and, and came, finally worked our way up to the gymnasium and, and just began to meditate and appreciate the goodness of God. We spent some time as a family praying for what's coming and the upcoming youth conference and all the things that are going to happen. And Listen, Lord, the Lord has given us a huge tool, huge tool, and I'm so excited about it. And I'm grateful for those that had a vision and a dream for this for so many years because it has now come to fruition. And I love and I think it's fitting that the first time we open it up and we use it, we're sharing it with many other churches. Because it is ours, but we get to share it with other churches. There'll be hundreds of teenagers on this property Friday night and Saturday morning. And all the, by the way, all of you are welcome to come. You can come and participate. And this is what your pastor does all over the country, all year long, especially in the summer, preaching conferences. And you get to come and participate in that and see that and see what it looks like. And so for the last three months, I've been doing a study on what kills churches. What kills churches? Brother Coons and I talk a lot about church planning. I know Brother Street's got a burden for it. The Old Testament command to a young couple was to be fruitful and multiply. And, and uh, we have tried to do that. We have four children. We've doubled ourselves, right? And I believe in progeny if the Lord allows you to do that. But in the New Testament, God also wants the church to be fruitful and multiply. I oftentimes wonder what this church will look like 50 or 100 years from now if Jesus tarries. In fact, I challenge you. Let me ask you a question. Is anybody, can anybody point to me a church that is older than 70 years that still believes or preaches or does the things they did 70 years ago right now? I know of a few that 50 years, yes, but I'm not even going to go back to 300 years ago or how about 2,000 years ago when the churches were first being started? What about the church of Ephesus that Jesus and Jesus wrote to? What about the church of Pergamos and Thyatira and the church of Laodicea? Where are those churches today? Eventually, churches are a lot like people. They eventually die. They die. But thank God for churches that give birth to new churches. Thank God for that. That's why this church planning conference, Brother Street and Brother Koontz and others in this room, is so important. And, boy, I'm so thrilled that our church gets to participate in that and birthing churches and, and mission works, too. Our missions conference and being able to start ministries around the world. And we have, I'm not going to name the countries because you know we're online right now, but we were able to now help uh, plant churches in other countries. And that's going to happen in the next few years. And it's been going on for several years. And I thank the Lord for that. But I'm going to ask you the question today. Where will this church, what will it look like 50 years from now? I'll be 96 years old. I'm not going to be alive. 
The way I live, I'll be lucky to be 70 years old as hard as I run, right? It's crazy, right? But where will it be? How, what will it look like? Uh, what kind of preaching will go on in this place? What kind of singing will go on in this place? Will people still be reached? Will Jesus still be emphasized? Will the truth be preached? Or will it be like many other churches, 99% of them, who eventually lose what they originally stood upon? The average church fails after two generations. Don't worry, we'll end on a very positive note. You know that. The average church fails between two to three generations, and that's when it begins to fall. So I've been thinking about that a lot, and I had a few conversations with some other preachers that were older than me about this subject, and I began to get consumed with it, and I went to my, one of my favorite teachers. He's a good teacher. His name's Rudyard Kipling. He reminded me of a great group of teachers that I like. He says, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. <laughs> Let me read that again for you. Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The Jungle Book, he said, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. The names are what and why and when and how and where and who. And so I began to ask those questions. I began to research. I began to study. And I've been doing this message. I've been building up for three months. And I thought surely immoral sin would be at the top of the list. But then I saw that it's not at the top of the list. It is in the list, but not the top. And I know of a pastor, a friend of mine who has taken two churches where the pastor failed morally and he's able to take the church and build it back to where it is. And now another friend of mine is pastoring that church and it's thriving. And he took another church that fell because of moral sin and now he has got that church thriving and going again. It wasn't that. I'm not condoning that, but it wasn't that. I thought that would be it because it's the big sin, right? It's moral sins. How about financial issues? The pastor steals money. That happens a lot. Let's just be Real talk today, or, or not only the pastor, but the staff. I know of a church right now. I could tell, tell you the name of the church and the city it's in. And I've been there, and the pastor stole money, took money, and his assistants even took money. But thank God now it's pastored by a new man, and the church is doing very well. So as I studied the list, I come to the conclusion of all my research that there's one main thing that will destroy a church. And it's disheartening. Because it's not external attacks like it was in the early days. In fact, external attacks usually thrive the church. And it's not even the deep, gross, big sins that we think about. And finally, it dawned on me, it's the same problem the children of Israel had all through the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. Right here. The tongue. Gossip kills more churches in America right now than anything else out there. It's awkward to bring that up in this pulpit because obviously this could sound like an accusatory message and I'm not doing that at all. But I do know this, this church is big enough and I have heard some feedback enough that it does happen here as it happens everywhere. In my research, I Googled it and I know Google doesn't have all the answers and I also looked to emails. I'm on an email list that I get from church researchers and the Pew Research and different things like that, and I put all these, some of these stats together, but one of the things that really floored me is you will find that gossip and a slander and a busy mouth are some of the biggest causes of church failure. We just can't resist it, right? It says that people talk about three major things, people, things, and ideas, and when they talk about things and ideas, it's, it's, it's safer ground, but when they begin to talk about people, they start to tread on dangerous ground. I was shocked when I read this stat. It said that a study showed that gossip potentially makes up to 70 to 80% of human conversation day in and day out. And when I heard that, I thought, that's not even possible. But then I began to think about the political realm. And I thought about religion. And I thought about even the way people live today where we are so easy to criticize. And we go into a restaurant and we'll be able to find something negative before we'll find the other 50 positive things first. And then the saddest of them all is when a Christian goes to the Christian about another Christian and says something bad about the other Christian. Today I want to challenge this church to make sure we don't do that. Isaiah has just spent a whole chapter in chapter 5 and it's so quiet by the way, I'm just curious. Just, y'all okay? And Isaiah chapter 5, he has just spent a whole chapter calling out the nation of Israel. He says, God has put up a, a hedge about you, Israel. And boy, he has blessed you and you've brought forth grapes. And, and boy, this has been exciting and this has been wonderful. But all of a sudden now, you started to bring forth wild grapes. That's not what God was expecting. And so he has now taken that hedge away and you're in trouble. And then for six times, uh, Isaiah says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can read it later. And Isaiah almost starts to feel good about himself because he's thinking that those big sins out there, those serious sins out there are caused 
causing the problems of Israel. And that's how we Christians get sometimes. We think society today, all the stuff that's going on out there is causing the church problems and why churches aren't growing. And yes, they have a part of it. But then Isaiah, watch this now, in chapter 6, he sees God. He sees God high and lifted up on his throne. He sees the smoke fill the temple. He sees the train. He sees the seraphims hovering about God with six wings. And with twain they cover their face. And with twain they cover their feet. And with twain they did fly. And all these seraphims cry out for all eternity is three words. Holy, holy, holy. That's right, the same word three times. And they say it over and over and over. And Isaiah says the smoke fill the temple. And all of a sudden when Isaiah saw that, he went from Isaiah 5 of woe to that crowd to this. Woe is me. And instead of saying, watch this, look with me there. I am a man of unclean living. I am a man of unclean body. I am a man of unclean thoughts. He makes this statement. He says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And once he acknowledged that his lips were unclean, revival begins to break out. And God all of a sudden summons one of the seraphims to pick up a live coal. This is, people can have all the debates about whether this is literal or symbolic. The fact of the matter is this. Isaiah sees God in his glory. Isaiah sees God in his holiness. Isaiah sees God in his righteousness. And all of a sudden Isaiah recognizes that I'm a whole lot more like the Isaiah 5 crowd I was just preaching to than I am a whole Holy God and God, I'm part of the problem. My unclean lips are a part of the problem. And God says, now you're talking, son. Boy, I'm excited for you. And he takes the hot fire coal with the tongs and they place it upon his lips. And the Bible says that once it had touched his lips, his iniquity would be taken away and his sins are purged. And watch this now. Isaiah now is set free to write 60 more chapters in one of the most amazing books of the Bible. Isaiah is often called the Bible in one book as it talks about the, the birth of Christ. It talks about his holiness. It talks about the second coming. It talks about the rapture. It talks about, there's so many verses in the book of Isaiah. And Jesus quotes from Isaiah more than any other Old Testament book in the Bible. What happened to Isaiah? He realized that his lips had become a part of the problem and not a part of the solution. The obituary of the church. It's not what we think it is. We have taken our lips that God has saved. We've taken this tongue that God has blessed. And we have defiled it. And I think when we think of unclean lips, we think about swearing and cussing and talking dirty jokes and things like that. But may I show you from the Bible in just a second that it's not just that. Critical spirit. Gossip. Criticizing other people. God despises that as much as anything. In fact, God hates the very utterance of complaining, and you'll see it in the Bible. And here's why. It stems back to the ultimate sin that God despises. It's pride. And anytime I, Randy Dingen, have complained, it's because my pride got in the way. Pride is destroying our churches. Gossip is destroying our families. Critical spirit, a negative tongue, saying things that are unseemly, saying things that are not of edification, saying things that are hypocritical because we sing in the choir, we sing in the pew, we sing in the congregational great songs and hymns, and then we turn around and say something very hateful and negative about somebody else. What is going on? That's the first question that Rudyard Kipling reminds you. What is going on? Here's what's going on. Take your Bibles and turn to John James chapter 3 real quickly. Austin, come on up here. Chapter three. Take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 3. James Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, it says, he says, Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Stay with me now. Here we go. What is going on? Look at verse number 5 of James chapter 3. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter of fi little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. God is saying, that's beasts, and birds, and serpents, and everything of the sea is easier to tame than the tongue. 
tongue of a man. A tongue sets fire. A tongue can be destructive. A tongue, watch this, here's what the Bible calls it, can be our equivalent of that of deadly poison. What? Number two, why? I said, I want you to open up this bottle first and read, drink that for just a second. What's wrong? It's not sweet. That's unsweetened tea. All right, put that down, and I want you to open up this one and try that one, Austin. He says he likes tea. Usually he loves chocolate milk. Oh, yeah, that's a lot better, isn't it? Isn't that a lot better? Why is it better? It's sweeter. This contains unsweetened tea, and this contains very sweet tea. Not just sweet tea, but very sweet tea. Um, can I ask you an honest question? Will you drink both of those, or will you drink? Jane, what are you going to do with the other one? You're going to throw it away and waste my money, won't you? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Austin. Give me a hand. Thank you, maybe. Watch this. No, it's yours. It's yours. Oh, okay. You're going to let make me throw it away, too. Wow. He is his father's son, that's for sure. <laughs> I often think of myself as a bottle of tea. And God sometimes wakes me up and wants me to And I wonder sometimes what God's going to taste when he tastes of what my speech is. Tonight we'll talk more about the life of the church. And in James chapter 3, God says that bitter waters and sweet waters can't come from the same source. And yet we Christians have become masters of that. So why, pray tell me, that's the qu second question, why? The Bible says the tongue is a fire, verse 6, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. Why? Why must we live like that? We always have to find a reason to criticize. Why must we always be negative and hateful towards people and about people? Why? Did I get made fun of because my parents were deaf? What was wrong? What was the crime? They weren't asked to be born deaf, but they were deaf, and yet I got in many schoolyard fights because kids who knew nothing about my parents said hateful, cruel things about my mom and dad just because they were deaf, about my baby sister just because she was deaf. Why? Why do we have to do that? Why have I done that? Why have I said that? Why have I said something negative about a preacher? Why have I said something negative about another person? Nobody wins when we do that. You'll be hard-pressed to find any time Jesus criticizes and gossips about people in the Bible. You'll be hard-pressed to find Paul. Paul brings up negative things sometimes to warn the good people about the dangerous things, but he didn't dwell on negative talk. He didn't dwell on criticism. The book of Psalms is the longest book of the Bible. It's called the book of Psalms because there's and songs written by people who realize the goodness of God and they realize that God had been so good to them. I can't help but let praise escape my lips every time I criticize somebody, every time I say something hateful about somebody, I'm smacking God in the face and saying, God, you haven't been good to me. Cut out the middleman. As soon as someone starts gossiping about somebody, why don't you just call that person and say, hey, someone has something to say to you. Go ahead and tell them what you're going to say. Every gossip has to have two ears. People will quit criticizing if somebody ain't listening. Help me now. Somebody tell me why. Why do we get on social media all the time and blast somebody just because they don't believe like we do? Help me. Look at my, go to my social media. You won't find me attacking and criticizing people. Why? Because I got enough issues of my own. Nobody wins when I blast somebody else. And I'm saying this only as a testimony because I feel like I didn't earn the right to preach this, but a preacher called me just the other day and said, Brother Rain, I just want you to know I used you as an example to my daughters. I said, tell me about it. He said, my daughters got attacked by somebody because they're preacher's daughters. They got criticized. He said, I sat him down and said, hey, be like Brother Randy. I've been around him so much, and everything he's ever said about somebody or a preacher or a person, he could tell them to their face because it's always been good. And he, he said, his daughters called me Uncle Randy. They said, be like Uncle Randy. The daughter said, we want to be like Uncle Randy. My daughters, my two oldest daughters were pulled aside twice recently by preachers asking him, how, how did you turn out? How, how come you love the Lord? How come you love church? And they said, my daddy just didn't let us talk negative in the house all the time. They know that. They can testify to that. I don't like it. It's a waste of time. Nobody, I ask you right now, I challenge this church and people online, ask God if he's pleased with what we say about other people. Don't care about me. Ask God. You know what I've learned in all the years? I've counseled hundreds of abuse cases and I've counseled teenagers and I've caught a lot of tears. You know what's amazing? How few teenagers actually dwell on the physical abuse they went through, but rather they'll talk about the words they were called and the things that were said to them. They'll dwell on that a whole lot more than they will even the physical abuse. 
It's amazing how powerful, how destructive our lips can be and our tongue can be and our criticism can be. Oh, you want to criticize me? Help yourself. I'll have more respect for you if you come criticize me to my face. I won't get mad at you. At least I'll know where you stand. I admire people. Two or three men every year. They're sitting here today. They come to me every May. Preacher, I don't like it when you travel all summer. Thank you. I appreciate it. Love you, man. We're not mad at each other. I respect them. They tell me the truth. Why do we do things faster? And then why do we call somebody else? Somebody help me. How does that do anything? What's the reason why? Why? Why do we do that? Does it make us better? Does it make us be able to strut our, our ego a little bit? We're proud of it. I, I said something bad about somebody who's not here. I'm somebody now. Why? Why? Number three, who? Who? I'm not mad at anybody but the devil today. But I'm disheartened because I hear it all the time. In fact, preachers quit calling me now. And a preacher called me the other day and started to criticize another preacher. And I said, sorry, buddy, I don't do that anymore. If you got something nice to say about him, let me know. But if not, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to this conversation anymore. He says, I'm sorry, Brother Randy. We changed subject and we had a great talk. I'm done. I don't want to know it. I got, I got enough things in my mind and my heart. All the heartbreak and all the damage out and all the people that are hurting out there. And there's people out there that just want somebody to look them in their eye and just say, somebody loves you. Somebody cares about you. Somebody thinking about you. Somebody cares about you. Boy, we always got something to say when things aren't going our way. The church this, this, my job this, my boss this and that. At least be honest. Go to your boss tomorrow and tell them what you really think of them. See how long you still have your job. Help me now. I've always said to my wife, I wish one Sunday... We would all come here, and we'd speak the absolute truth to what we, each other about what we think about each other. I wonder how long this church would last if we did that for one Sunday. Like, you had no choice, but you had to say exactly what you think of somebody. Woo, wouldn't that be a Sunday here at Bible Baptist Church? Hey, you're a jerk. Okay. That's how you really feel, right? Stay with me, church. I love you. You know that. I'm just, it's coming. Number three, who, 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 who am I talking about? Me. Me. Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. It's easy to sit here and say, oh, I'm glad he's burning up those gossips. How do you know they're gossips? Boy, I'm glad he's burning up so-and-so. How do you know so-and-so's a gossip? Boy, I'm glad he's, he's parking on her train right now. Boy, he's getting her. Boy, he's calling her out. How do you know she's a gossip? How do you know, huh? Somebody been listening, huh? Help me now. Help me now. Who? Me. I'm not preaching. Right now I'm preaching to me. I am the problem. Isaiah, what me? I am a man of unclean lips. I have defiled you, God. I have messed up. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Purge my iniquity. Cleanse my lips and touch my tongue. Me. Number four, and I'm done. Where? What, why, who, where, where? Where do we go from here? Here's where we go. See God in his glory. See God in his glory. See God for who he is. Realize that a holy, righteous, perfect, spotless God who, who had no obligation to be good to me reached down and saved me in my despair, plucked me out of my sin and my miry clay and put me on a rock and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. I'm never going to tell now. I'm going to heaven someday when I die. All my sins have been forgiven. I've been justified. I've been sanctified. I've been glorified. I've been glorified. I've been sanctified. I'm never going to touch hell. I'm a child of God. The King of Kings is my friend. I know his name, and he knows mine. God, forgive me when I bicker. Forgive me when I criticize. Forgive me when I'm negative. Forgive me when I'm bad enough. It's not worth it. May my lips be full of praise. May my lips be full of goodness. May I speak of joyous things. May I speak of good things. Why? God is too good. Life is too short, and I ain't all that. Isn't it interesting? Look at verse 8 of Isaiah 6, and I'm just about done. Go there real quickly. It says in Isaiah chapter 6, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Notice this, the Lord never says a word. If you back up the seven verses, he hasn't said one word. He just showed up. Isaiah says, woe is me, after he hears the angels speak. And then God's like, okay, now that he's gotten right, let me ask this question. Hmm. Okay, here, let's ask this. Watch this. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? The Trinity, who will go for us? Then said I, 
Here am I. Send me. God was smart in all his wisdom. He didn't ask that question before Isaiah got right. But knew once Isaiah got his lips right, he would say the right thing. I wrote a poem called The Obituary of the Church. The Obituary of the Church. Church is crumbling everywhere, and many seem to not really care. What, want, what once meant much to so much to a community now shows how far it is from immunity. What is the cause of this great decline? How shall this be? How could this be? Maybe we shall opine. Or maybe that's what started this all in the first place, speaking so frequently without the seasoning of grace. Churches everywhere are falling away, and for a peculiar reason, especially today. Is it the big sin of building program or business meeting? Or is it church ministries quickly fleeting? Let's just blame the devil. It's his fault. Surely it's his. Or should we deliver this as if taking a quiz? What could it be? Our nation is grasping. Is government that bad or is education not lasting? It's none of the above. Let's make a quick turn. It's something that can cause a very bad burn. It's a word here or a phrase there that shows our God our lack of sincere care. Gossip has crept in and taken over. Words spoken negatively of sister and brother. Amazing, isn't it, the power of the tongue? Starts with the old as they train the young. It was always, if you ain't got nothing good to say, well, right now that phrase has gone away. Because what creeps out of our mouths or a deaf person's hand is something so poisonous and kills the spirit of any a man. God desires that we speak something kind. Instead, we are masters of talking behind. We criticize and moan and talk less of folk while the devil laughs at us like we are some big joke. God's intention is that we praise and sing and let positivity out of our mouth consistently ring. So as we watch the churches fight for their life, we must combat the, combat the slander and the strife. Let's praise, let's be thankful, let's shout with a smile. Let's not let anything out of our mouth come that is vile. We think it's cussing that's really bad, but it's actually the gossip that can make most sad. So many, so may the church's obituary be thrown out because God's people have ceased to pout. And when choosing our words and what we share, speak of positively love, praise if we so dare. Life is too short and God has so blessed. May, may my tongue make it clear what is stress. Lips of praise and a tongue of joy for the eyes of every little girl and boy. Speak as a smile with never a frown so this church will be known all over town as a church that praises and shows real gratitude uh, by our lips and tongue and our positive attitude. So let's tear up this obituary and make it known that gossip is no longer here and our cover has been blown. Uh, so thank, so think, pray, speak and praise what is true and bring the churches back with a mighty I love you. <laughs> Woe is me. I refuse to let this church die. 24 years I've been here now. God's blessing. Let's all jump on this bandwagon right now, and it's a good one. We praise and talk. I know we got to deal with negative stuff sometimes. I'm not saying we never say. Some people are sometimes talk, preach, I just want you to be aware. I know you hate me hearing negative stuff. No, no, I get that. Sometimes we have to deal with stuff. I get that. But you know, what I'm, you know exactly what I'm talking about today. The social media has really amped it up. Keyboard cowards is what I call them. People will type things that they'll never say to somebody's face. Keyboard cowards. That's what you are. Oh, for a generation where we just speak truth and love. And speak of the goodness of God. My last thought is this. We might as well start doing that now. Because gossip's not allowed in heaven. Heads about eyes are closed. Thanks for listening to this. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here from Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. Let me take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus. He came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that. And man has tried in many of its 
efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital. Because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this. You must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus, and that's the same thing he says to you and to me even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We are physically born under this physical planet, or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I wouldn't be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father. We become his sons, daughters. We become his children. And we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says or what I have ideas about or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible. And in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.